So one really impact I expect from this is increased oversight from not only uh, regulators, but also policymakers and central banks. One of the biggest risks that central banks are worried right now, right now, is not really Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, it's really stable coins. Henry, it's a real pleasure to host you again. Uh, I think it's been five years or so since we first began talking about crypto in Hong Kong. You are now in the last, in the last big cycle. You're now zooming in from Yerevan, Armenia, right? Exactly. Beautiful Armenia. I love it here. I spent a couple of weeks here. You know, it's a bit too hot in Dubai. So coming here and enjoying it. The organic fruits, the nice food, nice people, beautiful country. I recommend everybody come and visit, by the way. One of my favorite <laughs> places in the world. Well, it is too hot in Dubai right now, which is why only Gaurav is flying the flag right now in Dubai. Um, and I look forward to seeing you, Henry, in Dubai so you can give us tips in uh, Armenia travel. But today is quite a big day for you. Um, in the intro, we introduced you as a senior advisor at PwC, where that's where you were when I first met you. But today is the day you're officially launching your crypto fund. Tell us about that. Absolutely. First of all, thanks for having me and thanks for all the listeners as well for uh, enabling us to share our passion of crypto and the future of money with you all. Now, as you mentioned, Ronit, it's a big day. You know, I was uh, previously the global crypto leader at PwC, where we built this whole global crypto team in you know, over 25 countries and uh, hundreds of engagements on crypto. But obviously, I really believe there's a space in the market for institutional grade crypto hedge fund, for institutional allocators, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, endowments, foundations, family offices want to allocate to the crypto space. And often the best way to do it to learn about it is via hedge fund managers, where you can allocate, learn from it, and actually then enter the space uh, more thoroughly. And actually, that's for this purpose, we're launching uh, Nine Blocks Capital Management, which is backed by Nine Mast, which is a billion dollar plus hedge fund in, in Hong Kong. And we're launching Crypto Market Neutral Fund. And Nine Mast is actually putting the first $75 million in the fund. And the, what makes this fund different is obviously it's very market neutral. So it allows you to actually uh, get, generate some alpha regardless of the directional view of the markets, right? We do a lot of relative value basis trading and other strategies uh, that are irrespective of how, what direction the markets go. But also what's really important is it's very institutional. So we obviously now registered in the Cayman Islands. We have an office there. We have three portfolio managers there. But also this week, we were very excited that we got a, a provisional approval from the Dubai Virtual Assets Regulatory Authority, the crypto specialized regulator uh, to also set up a presence in Dubai. And the way this business is built it's very, very institutional. It's made for institutional investors, not only from a regulatory compliance perspective, but also from a risk management perspective, counterparty selection perspective, how we actually run the business, and also the individuals themselves in the fund. Uh, you know, the really business is run by people that have, you know, decades of experience in the traditional hedge fund industry. And now we're bringing these skills in the crypto hedge fund. So a very exciting day. Uh, you know, so still in the crypto space, still a senior advisor to PwC, you know, still involved in the family there, uh, but really trying to focus and bridge the gap between institutional allocators and active crypto hedge fund management. And I look forward to tracking the fund and hearing also about your views and what's happening in the markets now. But before we get into that, let's go back in time. Henry, how did you first get involved in the crypto space? What was what was the journey, the path that led you into crypto? By background, I mean, you're a lawyer, a professor, a, a consultant, all kinds of things. How did you get into crypto? Absolutely. No, I've been in crypto since 2014. Uh, and actually, I organized my first crypto Bitcoin event in January 2014 in Hong Kong, where I was just to chair the Financial Services Committee at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. I remember after the event, uh, the chamber got complaints from people saying, what are what are these events on money laundering that the chamber is organizing? So it's funny how things have changed since then. But as you mentioned, I grew up in, in Canada with a traditional Armenian family, and uh, you know after after my uh, uh, law school became a lawyer, moved to Hong Kong, moved to China, did a degree in Chinese law, and then moved to Hong Kong, worked as a hedge fund lawyer. Then it was obviously in uh, in banking, covering the hedge fund space at UBS, and then obviously uh, that's how I discovered slowly when I was working at the bank, realized this is not efficient. There must be better ways of actually providing financial services. And I, I, that's why I discovered fintech. I remember uh, it was the first early days. Uh, actually, my TEDx talk on fintech is the first big major uh, video uh, on fintech on the web. And I started teaching it as well. Since 2015, I've been teaching the first fintech university course in the world. And uh, since then, many other courses have taken place. And, and uh, you know, then I joined PwC where I started the team. The crypto team was literally myself, 
And then obviously we grew up to a big team of in over 25 countries, like I just mentioned. Uh, and then obviously until the hedge fund started. So really the way I discovered crypto was really curiosity initially. Uh, and the, the, the day I actually learned about Bitcoin the first time, it's a bit of a funny story. And I talk about it in my last book, the, the book of crypto, because I got asked this question a lot, uh, is I was, uh, I, had a, I was the president at a time of the Armenian community in China and Hong Kong. And uh, we had a CTO who we had this, uh, uh, who, who was, we just did, did the website. And when I had done the negotiation of the website, my CTO at the end said, do you accept pay payment in Bitcoin to this provider, the website provider? And I was like, what is this guy talking about? It's complete nonsense. I just finished negotiating. He's bringing this thing, this thing up. But it got my, it sparked my curiosity. And I started looking at it, Googling it. And uh, I remember a couple of uh, days later, I uh, randomly emailed this young guy in Hong Kong who has just set up a crypto exchange, Aurelien uh, Menon, who set up an exchange, unfortunately, that is, that is now closed. And, and they were the first exchange to list Ethereum. And uh, that's how I, you know, I got hooked afterwards. And when you fall through the rabbit hole, crypto, as we all know, is very difficult to come back out. <laughs> it's, it's definitely a rabbit hole. Um, it's, it's a topic that attracts in equal measure some of the smartest people I know and vitriol from some of the most experienced people I know. Um, so it, smart people on both sides really either love it or hate it. I, I'm not sure what exactly it is that it, there's no kind of, mm, right. this is interesting. There's other, wow, or uh, money laundering. Or, and I love that as well. If you were looking right. at this space, uh, particularly the context, if you're looking at this space in the context of particularly what's happened this year, how would you try to explain what's going on in the crypto markets? Um, particularly to people who are skeptical, you'd be, you know, you've seen big drops, big drawdowns, big drops, and even the sort of so-called blue chips, right? I mean, ETH and Bitcoin have halved despite the recent big rally. Yeah. Some other coins have gone to zero or close to zero. Explain, I mean, what's your narrative of what's happened this year? Uh, yeah, first of all, maybe to answer the first part of your question, absolutely, this is a very dividing topic in many cases, uh, and there's various ways, you know, like I've been teaching the topic of cryptos in the universities now since 2015, as you know, I have many books on the topic, including my last one that came out, I have social media shows, uh, I have a podcast that is 160 country in five languages, uh, the, the big issue I see with, with crypto, I think why it's so dividing, is because it's so bold. In many cases, it makes us really reinvent how we have to think about financial services. You know, let's not forget on, on, in, on, the set, on October 31st, 2008, when Satoshi Nakamoto came out with the white paper, enabled us to, for the first time, for two people to send value to each other without any intermediary. It's something that we've been trying for many, many decades before, and that we finally were able to do it. And if you think about it, there's a lot of vested interest a lot of stakeholders that are those intermediaries, right? And I think that provides a lot of actually makes us rethink and really, uh, and it's, it's shocking in many regards. And it's normal that people have to be skeptical about it. Uh, on that topic, I found the best, uh, the one argument I give to anybody who's listening, whether it's academic, a student, a, a bank CEO, a regulator, is education. You may love Bitcoin, you may hate it. You may love cryptocurrencies, you may you think it's all Ponzi scheme, but at least you have the intellectual duty, the moral duty to at least try to understand it. And it's never been easier than now to understand cryptocurrencies. Uh, there's tons of videos on YouTube, books, online courses, which is very different, by the way, from when I started, where you really had to be a bit more technical to understand the better the topic. So I think that's the reason why it's very de divisive uh, from that perspective. And in many cases, it changes the status quo. We can talk about this today if you want, how countries adopt adopting Bitcoin as legal tender, how actually financial institutions are trying to deal with it, with an asset that is de facto decentralized and how we can provide some decentralization on it. Uh, now, when it comes to crypto markets this year, I think uh, it's definitely a bear market. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, I think I've had the privilege or the bad luck to see a couple of these bear markets so far. One pattern that I can tell you is that it's in bear markets that the best businesses are built. Whenever there's a bear market like this, this is time to build. And actually, this is a time where it cleans up some what I call the crypto tourists. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, I find it's the best time to hire people because the people who want to get into crypto now are the ones that genuinely believe in the game-changing technology and the impact it can have on not only on financial services, but on broader society as well. Uh, yes, it also cleans up some of the, uh, what I call the, you know, the FOMO and the, the, frankly, some of the exaggerations we had in the industry. Some of the valuations were completely out of control. 
not only at the early stage level, but also at the more mature level. Uh, but also I think it puts, gives everybody a bit of a time to look at it properly in the space. For example, if you're an institution allocator, this is a time to actually have to take this time to spend the time to understand the topic, do a bit of a deep dive on it, go to the great people like you, on it who covered the space in a very eloquent way, and then actually be ready to be and take the time without the FOMO and the rush that we see in the many of the bull markets that we've had before. And this applies not only on cryptocurrencies and digital assets, but across NFTs, uh, you know, the whole DeFi space, and including the metaverse, a topic that you know you've done a lot of great work on, uh, and put it all together. Uh, I think that's why I think this, this bear markets are very useful for. And so this bear market um, sort of standard hypothesis has been like with growth equity and other risk assets, monetary tightening has squeezed all risk assets. But in the, in the crypto sphere, there have been some specific other events that have gone wrong. Now, some of these things that have gone wrong, many people inside crypto world have been saying, hey, look out. But I guess when money was plentiful, these vulnerabilities were ignored. Um, so for me, a big event this year was Terra Luna. W what, for the audience, can you give a TLDR of what exactly happened there? Um, what were the flaws that people have been pulling out? And what was the trigger? Like, why did it blow up now? Yeah, absolutely. It's a very good point. And I think in the history of money, in the history of, history of cryptocurrencies, uh, Luna will always have a chapter in it. Uh, so then there's a couple of things. First of all, maybe the, the TLDR for the audience is what is Luna? Obviously, Luna was its own uh, cryptocurrency that came up, but also why this whole thing became a big issue was there was a protocol called Anchor where you could actually deposit, uh, you know, in, in, uh, what they call currency, a stable, an algorithmic stable coin called UST, uh, which basically allowed you to get on, on the Anchor protocol yields are double digit yields on basically US dollars at a time when in, in the real markets, uh, that those yields were very uh, definitely single digit, low single digits, if not uh, closer to zero. Uh, and I think the, the, this was all good as an algorithmic stable coin. Uh, you know, if you look at stable coins, uh, their stable coins are backed one to one by fiat money, uh, which is like dollars. And there's many of them, USDC, uh, that are regulated and some that are not regulated, like USDT, like the Tether. In the case of UST, it was algorithmic maybe backed, which is backed by Luna, which is our own cryptocurrency, which is great when the value of Luna has grown up and there's actually ample supply to cover it. But obviously, it's a problem if the value of Luna falls, for example. Uh, and this is actually something that actually we've been talking in the crypto ecosystem for some time. I actually, in my book, I talk about Luna. I talk about algorithmic stablecoins and mention that this actually may blow up in the event the price of Luna collapses. And this was submitted uh, last December, the manuscript. So it was way before the Luna event happened. So a lot of people actually were quite familiar with the mechanism. So as long as the party was going on, this was great. But of course, in the event of a crash, uh, this was actually going to, there was a very high chance of failure. And by the way, this is not a thing you, huh? we've had um, algorithmic stable coins of, many people have tried to come with this. There was basis, there was others that came up in the past uh, where for various either regulatory reasons uh, or actually purely economic uh, reasons, these uh, st uh, stable coin, algorithmic stable coins didn't work. And now, what did this mean for the future? What was the impact on it? Absolutely, this had a major impact on the crypto ecosystem. Uh, the reality is, uh, you know, PwC uh, releases a survey every year that showed that about one third of crypto hedge funds had exposure to UST, which is the, the, uh, the algorithmic stablecoin, and up to about 40% or something had uh, of, of crypto hedge funds were trading Luna. So I expect really at this year, there will be a cleanup of a lot of the crypto hedge funds who, uh, frankly, it's pure uh, bad uh, risk management, uh, basically had it in their book or they were, they were, they were on the anchor protocol. Uh, and obviously they got blown out from that. Um, and of course, that was the impact on the, some hedge funds. And there was some of the larger shops as well. We saw what happened to Three Arrows Capital, for example, and that created a ripple effect with many others in the industry from Voyager to Celsius, uh, who actually got, got affected by this as well. Uh, so what, does, what is the practical impact on this? Uh, for, sure, for sure, there is short-term pain. Many firms have paid the price, many have gone bankrupt, and unfortunately, many retail, retail investors have lost money as well. Uh, so one really impact I expect from this is increased oversight from not only uh, regulators, but also policymakers and central banks. One of the biggest risks that central banks are worried right now, right now is not really Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. It's really stable coins. Because if, let's say, you take a certain economy where people don't trust the central bank or there is inflation, people start using stable coins, then you lose basically your monetary power. You know, if people are using a different currency than yours. And there's no shortage of country today 
from Argentina to Turkey uh, to Lebanon, where this could be actually very, very effective today. Uh, so this is actually one of the risks that I expect central bankers to look more closely to what's happening with uh, stable coins. Uh, but the second big impact I expect is really from regulators. Uh, before this happened, there was many regulatory bodies that were trying to look at this topic. And now actually this is going to give ammunition to that. Uh, and a third conclusion, that I, third impact that I expect is really a focus on risk management. Uh, frankly, if it was a retail investor that was investing in Luna, you know, it's bad. Often people didn't do their due diligence, they did their due diligence or they didn't spend time on it. But if you're a professional investor, there's really no reason. Uh, this is actually, this is why you need to do proper risk management, people due diligence on whatever you're putting, especially if you're managing other people's money. So I think this is why I expect uh, increased focus on uh, risk management, but also counterparty risk. Uh, from the broader industry. This is not to the slim and run it to back in the day in, the, in, the, in our finance days where, for example, when Lehman Brothers went bust in 2008, you saw all the industries start doing due diligence on their counterparties, like whether it's a broker, prime broker, a bank, a custodian, and actually come up with scenario planning of what happens in the event of insolvency. And so I expect this kind of things to happen in the crypto industry as well. Short term, a lot of pain, Longer term, midterm, and longer term, this is definitely positive for the industry because it makes the industry more mature and more resilient in that perspective. So, unfortunately, hopefully, we won't have much effects, uh, much many events like these in the future. But the reality is, if history is a guide, there'll be other events like these, like we have, by the way, in traditional markets. Yeah. And one meme that's happened is that you know people are there. This famous Lehman Brother 2008 risk management department T-shirts that were floating around the internet. And now there's these, I don't know if you've seen them, I'm sure you have the Three Arrows Capital Risk Management Development t-shirts that are floating around now. And I don't want to, you know, obviously people, ordinary people lost a lot of money and we have to be sensitive about that. But there is a bigger point that these are some of the quote unquote smartest people in the industry that blew up this year. Um, the backers, I mean, there was some, you know, some legendary billionaires, both new and old, who who backed the whole kind of Terra Luna complex. So, I mean, what's the kind of general takeaway? I mean, beyond, I mean, DYOR is very commonly used, but I mean, what is the takeaway here? It's just, is it just, you know, you got to do lots of research, caveat mTOR, and because sure. if you say, look, I'm backing, I don't want to name them on screen now, but there were some of the, you know, quote unquote legends of the crypto world who were involved here, and they can afford maybe to lose a billion or two or even three billion, as we've heard in one case of a South Korean fund. Um, yeah. But in an ordinary person losing a hundred thousand, they're wiped out, man, they're gone, right? That can lead to real pain. Um, how, how do we, I mean, we're all kind of interested participants in the market. How, how do we make this a better market, so to speak? Yeah, it's a very good question. It's something that I've been trying to think about a lot. And actually, in my work, but I sit, you know, I sit on many uh, regulators, advisory boards, and policy boards. And this is a topic that I've been spending a lot of time, also in my academic life as well. Uh, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, first of all, yes, people lost money. And I think what's really for me shocking is some of these big VCs had a lot of exposure to not only uh, the Terra Luna, but other other players, you know, as well. Uh, you know, there's uh, I think, was there a lack of due diligence from investors? 100%. Uh, should I have been better oversight from people on, on counterparty risk management? 100%. Now, what does it mean, right? Like, what, what's going to be the impact, right? Um, I think whether we like it or not, the crypto industry, for it to grow from, let's say, 1.0 to 2.0, needs a, some regulatory frameworks around. I'm actually, maybe it's my lower background. I'm a loser. I'm a regulatory geek. I actually read regulations on Saturday night. Uh, but I think this makes a big difference because if you, for the crypto industry to flourish, you need this kind of level playing field. And actually the crypto industry has been one of the few industries that for many years has been lobbying for more regulations because they want to create this level playing field. And actually, even right now, if you look at globally, you have some players that are regulated, some are not, and that creates kind of uneven uh, offerings from that perspective. And actually people pay the price offering other users. So I think we'll have kind of a regulatory uh, um, uh, kind of overlay that we, that we need to play, uh, found the foundation that need to play a role there, whether we like it or not. Second, I would say some of the more disclosures that will take place. So for example, one thing that we have started to see over the last year is a lot of these stable coin providers provide more transparency. To be fair, many of the stable coin providers right now in the market offer reasonable uh, transparency to uh, users, right? Whether it's balances, they have an accounting firm to come and try to uh, 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 certify that the, the you know, uh, accounts are there, uh, you know, and, and the same thing. So I think I expect this to happen across the industry. For example, lending platforms. 
I, I expect in the future platforms like Celsius, like the, the, the new Celsius that will come up, uh, will need to offer more transparency to users. And I think, and that's how we're going to get the comfort of a lot of these uh, the users is that they get some kind of level of transparency. And that, by the way, this happened. The crypto, the stablecoin industry, has matured a lot the last two three years. And what the transparency that is offered now didn't even exist two years ago, right? So I think that's one thing I think I expect to see uh, from from that perspective. Um, was there, uh, uh, will there be more supervision, regulatory supervision of these players? Absolutely as well. I think let's look, Celsius is a very good example. Before even the incidents that happened, there was a number of US states that already had started investigations on Celsius. Uh, and I think now this kind of, uh, this kind of activity will get regulated. Uh, one thing to, for the regulators, by the way, I think it's important to understand, uh, you know, I've had the privilege of work with many regulators. I sit on the advisory board of many regulators around the world. Uh, is actually, I would say the average regulator that I work with is more knowledgeable than the average financial services professional. I think regulators often don't get the credit for the work they've done uh, and the knowledge they have. Now, the problem is obviously this is quite a specialized topic. And I expect to see regulators now to have specialized teams who are focusing on crypto. You know, according to some research from Cambridge University last year, uh, only 5% of regulators do not have somebody working on crypto, right? But now you need the manpower, you need the ability to do it. Dubai is a very good example with the, the, the new crypto specialized regulator, uh, the, the VARA, the Virtual Assets Regulatory Authority, which I think is a very smart way to deal with it because you bring a regulator who specialized on this and then can focus their attention on the industry. And that is beneficial not only for the jurisdiction, but also for the ecosystem because they can deal with regulators and policymakers who understand their topic and who are focused on the topic as well. I think Gaurav is going to jump in here with some more questions on regulation, Dubai, the Middle East, and, and so on. So Gaurav, over to you. Thanks, brother. I think the first thing to say is, uh, Henry, like uh, it's it seems like you've lived 10 lives in, in one bundle. So I don't know how you've managed to do all that you've done and condensed in such a, what seems to be a very short time frame. So hats off to you. And I don't know how people can keep up with you, but it's, it sounds like a lot of fun. I think we and, need Mrs. Henry on the call as well. Yeah, this is the, the, the backbone of the operation, the true operator, maybe. I don't know. I'm just, but congratulations on everything. And, you know, it's very interesting watching you map the conversation going through, because essentially what you've got here is we're talking about a path of a very short window of experience in which we're trying to really not, I wouldn't say disrupt because it's too frequently in a misplaced word to use here. I'd say it's a completely fresh ecosystem on a digital template, which has never been attempted before. So essentially what you're doing is you're taking centuries of financial mechanics and you're saying, you know what? People can do this independent of the current ecosystem that stands today, make it more efficient like you talked about in different ways. But as Ronit also touched upon, you get a lot of other people jumping aboard the train here, taking advantage of people who can't have that specialist understanding of what is actually tangible of benefit, long-term, short-term, institutional, or from a consumer perspective on this ecosystem. It's so young. It's still so right. young, right? And the amount that's been compressed into such a short time is unbelievable. And I genuinely feel that's why we're getting the frequency of volatility that you're seeing right now is because the access to information is also so, so, so you could. So it's really interesting. And you've talked about cryptocurrencies. We've talked about frameworks. We've talked about stable coins. And for me, that's an eventual conversation to uh, CDBCs, right? Because you see regulators getting involved, right? And you're seeing the ecosystem evolve. You're seeing stablecoin evolve. You're seeing cryptocurrencies evolve. And CDBCs are something that we've talked about a lot, but we haven't really seen them in action yet. And, you know, uh, we're seeing them coming through. And that's what I wanted to just sure. on that train of thought, touch on what you've seen about CDBCs and where do you really see them happening? Is it is it just, you know, people coming forward saying we must participate in this alternative digital ecosystem? Or are they also looking at it from a point of view of driving efficiency rather than control because they have trust? So I'd love your viewpoint on that to share with the audience. Yeah, great question, Gaurav. And this is obviously another topic that I spent a lot of time actually in my life. In my last book, there's about 50, 60 pages on the topic of CBDC. First of all, maybe for the benefit of our audience, a central bank digital currency, a CBDC for short, is a digital currency that is issued by the central bank. So today, if you're, if, if you're a central banker and you love Bitcoin, you're crazy. This is like a bit like an old taxi driver being excited to see uh, Uber or Lyft or Karim in the Middle East come in, in your region, right? Uh, and obviously, however, central bankers were not stupid. They realized, well, there's a lot of 
elements of Bitcoin cryptocurrency that we like that we can leverage as well. Uh, so, uh, so it's been very interesting to see the evolution of uh, CBDC. I've been literally covering it uh, since we had the first discussions on CBDC in 2016 with this, I think we used to call out of time the Fed coin in academic circles. And so really it's uh -huh. evolved uh, tremendously uh, since then. Uh, and uh, and uh, the couple of things, I think, first of all, there's no doubt in my mind that CBDCs will be here and a lot of countries around the world, we issue it and people will use it. I mean, to put things in perspective, uh, over 90% of countries now, according to the official data from the Bank for International Settlements, which is the convener of central banks, are looking at the topic of CBDC. And as actually, I'm, I'm writing my newsletter uh, in, in the, this week. There's, there's been a lot of work that has been done in this case, and things are actually quite advanced. Uh, 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 the, there's a couple of countries where actually this is live right now. You have countries like the Bahamas. Yes, it's a smaller country, where the SANS dollar is a central bank digital currency is issued. Uh, this means actually the currency, one CBDC is equivalent of having, if you want one, one dollar banknote, it just happens it's a, it's a digital currency instead of a paper banknote, and you put it in your digital wallet instead of your paper or leather wallet, if you want. So that is one of the big uh, differences from that perspective. Uh, the other thing I think where, so it's live in the Bahamas, it's live in Nigeria now with the Inera, and also probably the one country to watch here is, is definitely China. So uh, depending on the data source that you look at, uh, the official data says that there's about 140 million Chinese who are using it. Unofficial data you're hearing is more towards 400 million uh, users uh, are basically transacting in ECNY, which is a central bank digital currency of China, and using it for day-to-day -day transactions uh, for various uh, activities across the country. Now, the question is, why are people using this? I mean, not to get too academic about it, but there's two kinds of central bank digital currency. There's one called wholesale CBDC, which is between the central bank and the member banks, uh, which is you know, not a big topic. There's been some great uh, projects around the world. One of them actually, by the way, it's taking place in the, in the UAE with Project Aber between Saudi Arabia and, and, uh, and, and UAE. But also there's been a couple of them, the biggest one probably called right now, Enbridge, which is between Hong Kong, uh, uh, mainland China, Thailand, uh, the UAE. And there's another one actually out of, run out of uh, Singapore with Malaysia, Australia, other countries uh, involved uh, as well. Uh, now, the, um, where I'm really spending my time is on the retail CBDC, which is really the central bank digital currency that you go around, you know, everybody can use it on a day-to-day -day basis. And the question you got to ask yourself is why? Why would a central bank issue such a central bank digital currency? Uh, you know, in the US, there's a lot of arguments that can be given that it's it's a backup to the existing system. Uh, but the real reason is a couple of very conveying reasons. One of them is, is uh, visibility. Today, if you're a central banker, it's very difficult to get a live snapshot of the economic activity in your country. We have great estimates from GDP, from economists, from great investment banks, but these are all estimates. With a CBDC, you have kind of a live snapshot of what is taking place in your economy. Second is, is fighting corruption and money laundering. Today, uh, if you want to corrupt somebody, the best way is giving old school banknotes, which is the most private way of payment right now. And it's non-traceable and you know, everybody will accept it. Um, basically, when you move to an uh, economy that is using CBDC, uh, corruption by cash at least goes away. You can still give them a nice watch, put their kids into schools, give them a nice bottle of wine, but at least that's obviously monetarily is more limited. Corruption by money goes away. It's not, it's not a surprise when you see gangsters be arrested on TV, they, you know, they, they have piles of cash with them you know, not, uh, not the bank wires, you know? Uh, and, and the third thing you see actually is really uh, when it comes to um, what I call programmable money. It really allows us to actually make money smart. I'll give you a very good example. During COVID, every single American got $1,400. Uh, frankly, there's no way for the government to actually force these people to spend it. With actually uh, 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 programmable money, money, not only I can do things like put negative interest rate on the money, you actually have the interest rate at the level of the currency, but also have things where if let's say, Gaurav, you don't use the money I gave you, you lose it. So there's a lot of powers that people have like that. This is all great if you're a policymaker, your government, but also raises many scary flags. One of them is privacy, right? Uh, do I want the government to know every single transaction I'm doing? Uh, you know, and that becomes, I think, a bigger topic of conversation at a society level. I am personally convinced that the topic of privacy of money will be a presidential or prime minister election topic in many countries around the world over the next decade. You know, and you can argue that it, what, what's acceptable in China, for example, may not be the case in Europe, for example. A case in point, the ECB, the European Central Bank, uh, recently published a report that found that the average European prefers to have more privacy than convenience. 
and they're happy to sacrifice convenience if it's going to affect on their uh, on their privacy. And that's, that's something I think we'll see. Many GDPR, countries. right? That's how GDPR came into effect initially, right? I mean, that's yeah. what that's what happened with a bunch of things. But you know, you're talking about this from a futuristic point of view. You can, you know, there's a there is an example that's happening already today. I know that, for example, in San Francisco or another state, if, if I've got it wrong, but I do know that, for example, Amazon Go was sued by consumers because they didn't accept cash because it was, no. it it actually was uh, contrary to their basic consumer rights to be able to, you know use cash to be able to buy goods so if it's happening at that level i'm sure it'll happen at an extended level but you know you know looking at crypto you know cdbc's crypto digital bank currencies it's very interesting also another topic which could be you know looking at uh, you know subverting the crypto uh, the 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 petrodollar conversation as well but that's political and and I, I don't want to go down that road today because i don't think we have the time and the bandwidth because we could take up another show and just talk about movements of of money just not programmable money the next conversation I want to have is is moving from CDBCs is talking about the adoption ecosystems which are looking at trialing that and how advanced they are. Right? You touched on Bahamas, you touched on a couple of other countries. Let's talk about the UAE, right? Yeah. You're very actively engaged in the UAE. You're, you're working with VARA, you're working with everything else. UAE is working with Saudi Arabia for CDBCs. What else attracted you to the UAE and, and Dubai? And you know, what is your thought process of engaging this ecosystem? What are you looking to... To, to capitalize on with what you see as an attractive element for digital infrastructure, looking at crypto and blockchain. Absolutely. Can you elaborate more on that thought process? Yeah, sure, of, of course. I mean, uh, as, uh, as uh, you mentioned, I mean, I kind of uh, operating a lot, uh, my new base is Dubai, so I'm operating a lot from Dubai right now. And there's a couple of reasons from it. Some of them are purely, I would say operational and, and physical is that first of all, you can come in and out, they can travel. You know, it's something, uh, you know, uh, people often forget. Last year during COVID, uh, I did four two-week quarantines in Hong Kong. You know, half of them with a government bracelet that if you leave your hotel room, it's six months in prison, right? So I think wow. and the risk of that anybody in your plane, anybody in your hotel floor test positive, you're going to government center uh, at a time for 14 or 21 days. So I think the uh, uh, I think what the crisis has shown us, uh, the whole COVID situation was uh, many, for many countries, it was a problem. Many other jurisdictions saw as an opportunity. Uh, and I think uh, the UAE was a good example of that, that remained pretty much open almost the entirety of the time with proper uh, oversight and, and management of it. I think, um, so I think the, one of the main reasons as the world is open right now, uh, and you need to travel, you need to be different places, you need to see investors, you need to operate, it's difficult when you need to do uh, uh, now what is a seven days in hotel quarantine uh, each time that uh, you want to go back, right? So it doesn't practically, there's practical reasons why Dubai is a base. And uh, I think that a lot of people, actually, especially from Asia, have uh, relocated there. In addition to the other great reasons Dubai has, quality of life, the good, good weather, all the kind of stuff, right? Um, but second thing I think is very important on this conversation is, is uh, crypto and fintech and policymaking. Um, it's very interesting because the, uh, the crypto industry, again, is one of the few industries that, like I mentioned before, it has been lobbying to have more regulations. They want to have oversight on this topic. They want to be regulated. I think that's what Dubai did very well by setting up the specialized regulator to deal with crypto companies. Um, and that obviously is, 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 has attracted and will attract many players that will come to, to Dubai for that, uh, to be able to operate from it. And I think it goes also in, in, in line with the broader uh, vision of Dubai, right? With the whole goal of uh, all the different initiatives going on from metaverse initiatives to some of the ones that are linked to different initiatives from sustainability to lifestyle and others. So I think this is one of the reasons I, I remain uh, very bullish actually on Dubai uh, as a crypto hub. Uh, not only for practical reasons that, you know, from it's a great place to manage the world, you know, operate globally. Uh, not only can you have this direct flights to pretty much anywhere, uh, but also that you, and you can come in, but also because there's regulatory certainty to a certain extent now, and you feel welcome. Uh, and that is actually, that is very, very important, uh, I think for any crypto entrepreneur, uh, but also for as an industry more holistically. And that's beautiful because I think uh, technologies like crypto allow everybody, allow, it's a level playing field. So pretty much any country can come and play a leading role in the space. The Bahamas is a very good example, right? Like in the Americas, the Bahamas now has become a leading crypto hub, but companies like FTX have moved there, including many others. You know, the Bahamas, because they saw that as an opportunity, they wanted to be dominant player, that provided regulatory clarity, and boom, they had it. Bermuda is the same thing. Uh, whereas if you look at some of the more traditional uh, old continent European countries, uh, it was not necessarily the case. Uh, and also, you need to be loyal to the crypto community, right? So other jurisdictions, without naming them, were very good at uh, marketing their crypto capabilities 
But when it came to actually getting some stuff done, either there was unwritten rules or actually things were not moving as fast as planned. And that actually creates a lot of frustration with the crypto community as well. So I think these are the reasons where uh, I think Dubai has a, if uh, things are executed well, has a good opportunity in front of itself. I'd love to circle back to how we actually started this conversation because in the interest of time, I know we're running a bit thin. So two two questions I want to touch upon. So starting with the news today that you've, you've launched your fund, congratulations once again. The two other pieces of news, which are also pretty big in the market one moment, is what's happening with Solana. Um, so, you know, one thing I wanted to understand from your side is usually, and I've been operating in fintech for a long time, wherever big spaces evolve rapidly with the adoption, fraud usually follows through or cyber attacks usually follow suit as well because they see it as an opportunity to, you know, bank effectively and, you know, make their money. So I wanted to understand from your side first, what do you see in, you know, these ecosystems that are being done on this digital frontier with cryptocurrencies, with CDBCs, with blockchain? Do you see the comparative fraud increasing or decreasing at a core level because it's baked in right from the start. And the last question I'd love to round off with is also as a piece of news is, what does Michael Saylor see that we don't in his movement from CEO to, to chairman of MicroStrategy? And so those are the two questions I'd love to leave you with and close out. Yeah, oh, God, these are big questions, uh, Gaurav. So I think a couple of them, uh, on the hacking side, um, I think I think a couple of things. Uh, this is a topic as well that I, I cover a lot in my in my newsletter as well, where uh, it's on LinkedIn newsletter, where basically a lot of the uh, hacking has been taking place uh, in, in the broader uh, in the broader crypto space uh, recently, right? So I think there's a couple of things. That, yes, the hacking levels have increased significantly last uh, last year. Uh, I think the, the Illicit activity of crypto has has decreased significantly, and there's data on it. Only 0.16% of crypto transactions now are linked to illicit activities, illicit wallets. Right? Uh, in in absolute terms, last year was 10 billion dollars, which is nothing, nothing if you compare to the amount of money that's being laundered in, in in illicit activities in the traditional world uh, from that perspective. Which, according to the UN, by the way, is between anywhere from up to uh, two to five percent of global GDP, which is 800 billion to uh, a couple of trillion dollars, right? So it's nothing on that side. Uh, what, however, the hack levels have increased. Actually, where the hacks are happening, a lot of them is linked to De DeFi, actually. Uh, so you know, so we had the Ron and Bridge recently. What you mentioned, the hack that took place a couple of days ago uh, of this uh, recording, is on the another cross-chain token bridge called Noma. Uh, and it's actually not still not clear how the hack happened, but there was about 200 million dollars that was hacked uh, in, in that case. Some of the recent hacks that we had actually were not linked to the technology per se. Uh, they're actually looking often more at governance. A very good example is the Ron and Bridge hack that took place a couple of months ago, uh, where basically a, a bridge is basically links two blockchains together. And really the, how it happened was purely a governance. You know, there was authorizations that were given that were not withdrawn. It's, prop, it's old school procedures, processes, and accountability, which by the way, there's a lot of experience in traditional uh, finance, which I think the crypto industry could benefit in being more open-minded and learning from some of the experience that these big banks, for example, have, how you actually build processes and procedures, uh, which, uh, you know, was not, that was the reason. There was nothing wrong with the crypto, actually. The, the, the smart contracts did what they were supposed to do. It was just the governance around that was bad. There was really a human element. Um, it's still not clear at the moment of recording uh, what caused the, the Nomad hack. And there was actually another uh, hack that happened, uh, uh, again, in the last 24 hours of this recording around the, uh, some Solana wallets. Uh, which again, um, from what information we have available at the time of recording now, is not linked to the layer one Solana blockchain, but really linked at some of the software uh, that was built on top of it. Uh, again, I'm sure there was there will be more information that will come out uh, in, in the course. Um, so I think that's what's happening. Uh, again, if today you're a hacker and you're not targeting crypto platforms, I mean, you're an idiot. You know, many of these uh, protocols, many of these crypto exchanges are honeypots that are waiting to be uh, to, to be hacked. Crypto centralized crypto exchanges now have become actually quite secure. I have to say, uh, yes, I think we'll continue to see some hacks, but you know, some of the big exchanges right now, I would say by and large, have pretty good not only some uh, cybersecurity uh, processes, controls, governance, how they're you know of coal wallets and other uh, uh, you know procedures, but also many of them have been certified now by various cyber certification uh, uh, mechanisms. Uh, but I think that this is why there's always they'll go to the weakest link, right? 
if it's always when the bear is running after you, you just want to be not the slowest person, right? I think this is what's happening with the uh, some of these protocols where um, I think some of these uh, you know things may have been overlooked from that perspective, unfortunately. The problem here as well is very difficult. How do you actually regulate or supervise some of these cross-chain platforms and DeFi protocols? Uh, and I think this is where due diligence becomes very important. Getting them audited becomes very uh, important. And frankly, a bit like comes back to what we were talking around it was mentioning at the start, due diligence and making sure that where you're putting your money, some of these platforms have done their diligence becomes actually quite important. Thanks so much, Henry. And if you if you don't want to comment on Michael Saylor, I'll, I'll take it to the next podcast with you. But but <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think we are running out of time. We're way past the mark. So I'll hand back to to Ronit, and we'll all speculate about that later, some point off the record. <laughs> Thanks so much. See, just just to round out on the hacks, um, it's true that illicit activity, Henry, is percentage wise low, but the hacks seem to have exploded this year. I mean, what, what's what's triggered it? Is it just, as you said, um, I can't remember what exact line you just use. If you're a hacker and you're not targeting these crypto platforms, you can almost not doing your job. But is it simply that just the value increase last year was so great that it's just a honeypot that's attracted hackers or or there's sort of certain state or parastate, parastate actors taking part here? Yeah, no, uh, for, so yes on all counts, right? So first of all, I think there was a lot of activity that came out on DeFi, for example. I mean, to put things in perspective, on January 1, 2020, there was less than a billion dollars in DeFi. And now we're over 200 billion, right? So things have exploded pretty quickly, pretty big, pretty rapidly. And anything that grows very fast, there's always loopholes and hackers will exploit mm. this, right? Uh, second thing, of course, uh, some of the hackers are becoming more sophisticated. Uh, now it's pretty well documented. There's a lot of groups, including from North Korea, uh, that are very targeted specialized groups that are focusing on crypto hacking, uh, just as a way to gain uh, assets for their uh, country or group or whatever it is. Um, and also some in certain specific countries as well, there's hacking groups. And now the beauty of crypto, we can trace these, right? So that, the irony for me is many of these hacks that have taken place, for example, there was one that took place last summer, but uh, it's very difficult to launder the funds. This is the irony of crypto. In many cases, uh, there was a case last summer where uh, another uh, DeFi protocol was hacked and the hacker had literally had to return the funds because we all know where the money is. We know we can trace it. So while you can launder little amounts, you know, but I think it's, you can launder a couple million dollars it's very, very difficult to launder these big amounts that are being hacked. You know, $100, $200 million will be very, very difficult to, to launder. Uh, people know your wallet. They can trace it. And now the traceability solutions we have right now um, on these platforms, on these things are very, very advanced. I mean, now some of the data that came out recently is that we were able to demix transactions that went to mixers, right? So it's pretty powerful what's happening. We can have a whole different podcast on that as well if you guys want. What I think I'm personally very afraid about is, uh, is old school scams. I'm, I'm a very big victim, actually. It's, it's one of the biggest things that bothers me. Uh, last month, there was uh, people got scammed for over 100,000 US dollars by people impersonating me. Literally what happens, they create fake Instagram accounts of me, uh, fake Twitter accounts of me, fake LinkedIn accounts. If I ever message you uh, or somebody looks like me, I tells you that I have a great trading strategy that delivers 10% a day, it's a scam. I wish I could do 10% a day. Uh, but this has actually become a very big problem. It's very sophisticated. A recent scam hack. I'm going to do a podcast episode in my, in my uh, the future of money podcast uh, soon, where I'm going to bring a victim. Actually, finally, a victim accepted to come out. Uh, there's been now obviously complaints at the FBI, at law enforcement, and they're going to explain the whole process. And normally, what they do, they go to people that know me or their acquaintances, and they say, "Hey, how are you doing? How's your crypto portfolio doing?" And there's fake websites now. They made them sign contracts and asking about their investment strategy. Ten uh, so a day. 10 a day is what I get from my group of all the people I'm on. Every 10 a day. day. Here we go. 10 a day. Here we go. And, and I blame really actually up to me 10% platform. a day. Uh, you know, I've been now, I've been to Instagram, I've been to Twitter, and I've been, they refuse to rec verify my account, for example, for reasons that are completely obscure. And I think this is one of the problems of Web2. It's so centralized, uh, especially these little cliques in the valley, which I think are really hurting. And this is why I think we're all big believers in Web3. And uh, what bothers me is uh, there's real people losing real money real victims. And this is kind of scams that really bother me because uh, it happens to me for the last two years every week. Uh, as you guys know, I have a big following of over half a million people. Uh, every week, I'll have two, three people email me, say, ah, Professor Arsayan, Henry, uh, I've had this, uh, uh, there's two scams that I see a lot. One of them is they, they send, uh, they have crypto on a certain exchange, no name exchange, and they say the exchange wants them to pay their tax payment before they can withdraw. That's a scam. Your taxes are your own business. It's not the business of the exchange. 
I'll get, a, I get still today about one or two people message me on that a week. Uh, the other one that I get maybe once a week is uh, they have their uh, account on a crypto exchange that suddenly doesn't exist anymore. And the exchange is asking them to download, put on their, uh, on their laptop, a kind of a, a, I forgot the name, it's called viewer, but basically gives the hacker access to your laptop. An old school scammer technique. I mean, there's a lot of videos on YouTube of a scammer payback and others who've done this. I get this still every week. And what bothers me, they won't go to people like Gorav, like you're on it, who know crypto or smart or tech savvy. They will always go to the most vulnerable people, uh, you know? So that's what really hurts me. Uh, I don't know what else I can do. I, I put warnings on this, you know, but that's what, that's kind of scam that really bothers me because those individuals, those victims, their first experience with crypto are with scammers and they're never going to come back. I mean, you know, it's a very big, and there's a lot of shame in that. The, often people don't want to talk about it. Uh, many of my victims that emailed me, I said, guys, please go to law enforcement. You know, I've been trying to work with law enforcement. I'm actually, I'm not able, the latest big hack that happened, I was able to trace where the money went. Uh, thankfully, we worked with Elliptic in that case. We are able to trace, and it went to one large exchange. I won't name it on the show now, but it went to one exchange, and I know it. And I've been messaging them. I said, please, can you freeze this account? Right? So we can trace the beauty of crypto where this is going, right? So I think this is some of the issues that we have in industry. So yes, I'm worried about the big state-owned hackers, but I'm also worried about some of these groups. Um, many of them are in Nigeria, by the way, pure coincidence, uh, at least the ones I've been tracing myself uh, with our team and uh, they're taking place. It's very, very sad actually from that perspective. So there's a lot of promise in the space, a lot of opportunity, but a huge amount of scams. So everyone be careful. Um, Henry, uh, today, and if you're listening to this audience on replay, this is, uh, gosh, what is the date today, Gara? 4th of August. 4th of August, <laughs> we're recording this. This is the day that Henry publicly announced the launch of his fund. Um, I've heard so much about it for months now, and I'm really excited to see you launch it. Congratulations. Regulate. All the best. Godspeed on the next adventure. It's not me. Next There's a whole adventure. team. We're an entire team on it. But yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Absolutely. Henry right. and team. Yeah, Henry. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, guys. See you in Dubai. for having me on the show. And thank you again for all the CFT, CFT for, for making this. And uh, thank you for Gaurav and Ronit for having me on the show. And to our listeners as well, to letting us share our passion of crypto and the future of money uh, with you all. If anybody wants to keep in touch, by the way, it's on Henry Arslayan, Henry with an I, Arslayan. I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn. I have online courses now on Udemy. I have my latest book, if you don't mind me plugging it, The Book of Crypto, which became the number one new release uh, in financial services, another uh, top 10 bestseller. And a lot of my content now is on YouTube and, uh, and uh, a lot of educational content if you want to learn about it. It's now in five different languages in English, French, uh, Spanish, Chinese, and of course, Arabic for the Middle East as well. So really trying to empower the next billion people uh, entering the crypto space and uh, being helpful in that perspective. So thank you very much, guys, for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Henry, with an eye.